Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the Cody Firearms Museum. We're taking a look at a couple of the guns out of their very extensive collection of interesting firearms. Now the three I have today all have something in common, and that is these are guns that were developed by Ed Browning uh, in cooperation with the Winchester Company. And these would go on to be Winchester's attempt at a self-loading military rifle during World War II. Now they never, never quite got adopted anywhere, but boy they give it a good shot. Now let's step back a little bit. Uh, Ed Browning, whose full name is Jonathan Edward Browning, uh, was the half-brother of John Moses Browning, whom I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, Ed Browning wasn't quite as good of a firearms designer, although he was not, he wasn't an idiot. Um, but he had the advantage of having that Browning family connection, and that allowed him to kind of have a little bit of extra leeway. Um, in places where other people might not be able to get an audience or a meeting, Ed Browning could, because his name was Browning. So the three guns that we have here specifically are all developed from Ed Browning's first attempt to get a US military rifle, and that was the Colt model of 1929. Now I did a previous video on that, and if you haven't seen it, you might want to go back and take a look at that uh, to give yourself the background on today's story. Uh, basically what happened was the 1929 uh, rifle designed by Ed Browning, manufactured by Colt, wasn't very good, had a lot of problems, was rejected uh, in 1930 by US Army Ordnance Department testing. Well, Browning didn't give up on it. He went back to Utah and on his own time in his own shop spent like the next eight years tinkering on the design and improving it. And uh, where the 1929 gun was a short recoil, he came up with an interesting annular gas piston system. And in 1938, he actually presented this rifle and improved gas piston rifle to the Army Ordnance Department. Now, this is one of those situations where if just some random stranger had shown up to Aberdeen Proving Ground with a rifle and said, hey, check out my cool rifle, they probably would have been turned away. Um, uh, the guys at Aberdeen were busy enough. They didn't have time just to deal with any Yahoo that walked through the door. But when Ed Browning walks through the door, John Browning's half-brother, well, okay, we'll make time for him. And they took a look at the rifle and they said, you know, actually, this is better than the 1929 gun. It's fixed a number of the problems. They didn't like that gas system, but they thought the gun had some real promise. So at that point, uh, Browning didn't have his own manufacturing company, uh, but he knew that Winchester might be interested. And in particular, Winchester had been caught kind of flat-footed in World War I. In like 1908, 1909, the Winchester company had made a deliberate decision to start working on a semi-automatic shotgun instead of a bolt-action rifle. And they had the choice between the two, they went with the shotgun, and that project really was a disaster. Uh, the Winchester 1911 self-loading shotgun, well, suffice to say, it's, it uh, gained the nickname of the Widowmaker. Not a good thing. And as a result, then World War I take, you know, happens, and Winchester doesn't really have any military design that they can offer. Uh, they made some 1895 lever actions, but that lever action was really not what most people were looking for. So they ended up having to manufacture someone else's gun, the British model of 1914 Enfield. They didn't really like that, it, it irked them. So by 1938 they could see that uh, stuff was going down. There, there was a very high likelihood of, of another world war and they didn't want to be in the same situation again. Now Ed Browning knew this. Uh, the guns that were in major contention for the US Army trials were the Pedersen and the Garand uh, and the Johnson rifle. And none of those were really available for commercial production rights. There wasn't really a way for Winchester to buy them. Uh, Pedersen was already working with the Vickers Company. Uh, Springfield was doing its own thing. It was a government uh, arsenal. It wasn't going to be selling production rights, really. And uh, the Johnson rifle was, well, Melvin Johnson had a company. He could do that. So when Ed Browning showed up with this rifle, which the Army had just taken kind of a, an interest in, this looked like the perfect solution to Winchester. So in February of 1938, Browning first shows up to start negotiating with them. Uh, by June, or I'm sorry, by October of 1938, they finalized a deal. They uh, bought the patent and the design from, John, from Ed Browning and paid him a, a flat fee and then promise of royalty uh, when the gun went into production. And he joined their engineering staff to start working on improving the gun. Um, since he was no longer just working out of a home shop, now he's got the facilities of, of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company. They can really get some good work done. So the three guns that I have here today, uh, this front one is the gun that Browning presented to 
Aberdeen Proving Ground. That's the one the Army thought was pretty good. Uh, and then he actually had made two more, which he brought to Winchester. And they are these two. He made one that was a sporting configuration gun and one that was a military configuration gun because there's no reason that Winchester couldn't market these things commercially as well as on the military market. So these two guns are virtually identical mechanically and we'll be able to take apart this one. This uh, Aberdeen gun is also pretty much the same mechanically, um, which is good because it is a wreck of a gun. I'll, I'll show you up close. It, time has not been kind to that, that particular rifle. So anyway, why don't we go ahead and take a closer look at these three. You can see what, what was going on here, how these worked, and then we'll take this one apart and look at the internals. All right, so here is Ed Browning's prototype rifle that he presented to Aberdeen. Now, I said this gun was kind of a disaster. One of the big things that has happened here is that at some point, the op rod has jumped out of its track. It should be riding in this track in the receiver, and it's not. Um, so it, we have a little bit of reciprocation here, but that's as much as we've got. Um, bolt won't go all the way forward. I, you know, you might be able to fix this, but it would involve like hammering on things and bending stuff. and. That's not happening at a museum. So, uh, in addition to that, we have a couple cracks in the stock. There's another one right here. Uh, the butt plate is missing. The barrel band is missing. Uh, the front barrel band's there, although its screw is missing. But we can still get a good look at what the basic design here is. Now, one of the Army complaints about uh, Browning's earlier 1929 rifle is they didn't like the fact that the receiver was very long. That limited the allowable, you know, the, the length of the barrel you could have in a given overall length. So what Browning did was instead of having the whole receiver up here and the trigger up front, and you'd have the bolt moving here, reciprocating into this backspace, and then the stock starts. Instead, he slid the, the receiver back into the stock. So you can see that as this bolt would reciprocate, it's actually coming down here into the pistol grip of the gun. That allows him to shorten the, the effective length of the receiver. Typically, you would have the trigger at like, the back of the receiver, but not here. So uh, that's one of the things the Army was impressed with. This early gun is actually some type of end block. This would have been some proprietary clip. Um, you know, Obviously, an in, in M1, well, I guess actually it might have been an M1 clip, for all I know. Uh, we don't have one. I can't open the bolt all the way, so it's not like we can test one out in there. But um, anyway, clip would have gone in. This design has just a basic standard follower, spring-loaded follower. So where guns like the M1 actively eject an empty clip, on this it would function more like one of the Monlicker guns, where when the, the last round is chambered, the clip falls out the bottom. So this is in 30 6 the standard military cartridge. Actually, the more I think about it here, the more likely it seems to be that that would be a standard eight-round M1 clip. Um, the only question is whether Browning would have been able to get one of those in 1938. And the answer is, I don't know, maybe. No. If not, it would be something similar. He used a commercial uh, tang sight here on the back, folds down, just something easily available. There is only one marking on this gun as far as I can tell. And it's right there, EXP Experimental 2005, uh, which would have been some sort of sequence number put on there either by Browning or possibly by Aberdeen. So once this experimental gun uh, gets a, a positive general reception from the military, Browning made a couple more to present to Winchester. And this is one of them. This is the sporting version. So you can see that this design is basically identical. We've got the same tilting bolt, uh, the same sort of mechanism where it runs back into the stock. Everything mechanically is the same. So we're going to go ahead and take this one apart to take a closer look at the gas piston because its sporting design makes it much easier to do that. Now this is still an old and tired prototype experimental rifle. So I can cycle the bolt a little bit, but it doesn't want to lock all the way back, and I don't want to force it. On this rifle, we have a fixed magazine and this little stripper clip guide. That's, of course, because this was intended as a sporting rifle. But you can see when the bolt goes into battery, the back end locks up like this. There's going to be a locking surface probably right under here. And when it cycles, the bolt, the back end of the bolt drops down, right, like that, and then goes backwards to cycle. So pretty basic functionality there. Now what's weird about this rifle is what's going on up at the front. So we have a barrel here. It is fixed in place. This isn't a recoil design. It is a gas piston. And we have a cover 
over the gas piston, which I can unthread. It's a long cover. There we go. And this is our actual piston. So when I pull the bolt back, which you can't see, but when I pull the bolt back, that's going to cycle. Now, this piece right here, I can pull that forward a little bit, take the handguard off. Now you can see the whole length of the barrel. The gas piston itself is actually underneath the barrel, and it pops out right here. Now I can pull this a little bit forward, and we can get an idea. There it is. So this is the actual connecting rod of the gas piston. That's what cycles back and forth. Now. How does that work, you might be wondering. Well, right up here on the underside of the barrel is a port in the barrel, a gas port drilled, and there's a little notch cut in that gas piston. Now remember, we've got this cover, which locks all of this together. Once that's in place, it creates a gas chamber, a uh, gas cylinder area right in here, so that when you fire, gas comes out that port, and the only place it can go is into that little divot, and then, once there's a lot of pressure, that forces the piston back and opens up. This is pretty similar. Uh, there are only, well, there are a couple other rifles that used similar systems. The German G41 rifles are one example, actually two examples. Um, although they didn't have a port drilled in the barrel, they actually used a gas trap system at the muzzle. Um, and the Czech VZ52 is a kind of similar si uh, system. Uh, there were also some other experimental guns used by the U.S. And, and probably some other countries that used this system. So these are both of the, the Winchester presentation guns from Ed Browning. To point out a couple of the differences, uh, the military version has a detachable box magazine, so it does not have a stripper clip guide the way the commercial gun does, the sporting gun. Uh, the sporting gun has this commercial style folding, although it doesn't want to come up now, uh, this commercial folding sight where the military gun has a range adjustable sliding sight, much more in the military style. Um, you can see the, the blind magazine here, the detachable box magazine here. There's magazine release in the trigger guard, although it's very stiff. Um, I think I failed to mention that the safety is this push button. We have an F on this side for fire, and it's S safe on that, safe for that side. Uh, and the sporting gun works the same way. See it. We see a couple very similar types of stylistic difference at the front end of the gun. The sporting gun uh, has a shortened stock. The military style gun has a full length stock. It's got a front cap here with a bayonet lug. Now it's also, I'll point out, one of the reasons that I disassembled the sporting gun is because the sporting gun has this mechanism exposed, where on the military gun um, there are, well you have to take the nose cap off and then you have to take the stock off in order to get to the piston to unscrew that. It's a much more complex system. Uh, well, it's not more complex, it's a more tedious system, and the less disassembly I have to do of some of, of screws and wood bits on guns in this condition, the better. So it's hard to say exactly what would have happened to these guns uh, at Winchester over the next couple of years. Ed Browning apparently really liked that annular gas piston system. However, on May 17, 1939, he died somewhat unexpectedly. He was in his early 80s. Uh, and at that point, uh, because of the, their arrangement, uh, even with his estate, Winchester retained the rights to work with this design. And they were able to take it and hand it off to another designer and replace this annular gas piston system with something more workable. So next video we do will be a follow-up to show what exactly Winchester did to change this gun and to try and make it more attractive to the military. So make sure to tune back in for that video. If you like this sort of content, please consider checking out my Patreon account. It is funding from folks just like you uh, at a buck a month who really make it possible for me to travel to places like Cody, Wyoming and check out these guns and bring them to you. And of course, if you are ever in Wyoming or specifically Cody, definitely take the time, stop in the Cody Firearms Museum, check it out. They have a fantastic collection and well displayed. You won't be disappointed. Thanks for watching. All right, we've got bonus footage for you guys who are still watching. You have earned it. So 
this is the original Browning uh, prototype that went to Aberdeen. And after I finished filming, I went to do a bunch of pictures and accidentally disassembled it, which sounds weird, but that kind of is really what happened. So I then went ahead and pulled it apart a little further and figured, let's take a closer look at all of the weird internal bits. So here is the full action. There are two screws, which I've already taken out, which I'm leaving out, which hold the trigger assembly and the magazine body in place up onto the main receiver. There are holes back here to lighten it. So this comes off, and this gives us our uh, trigger assembly. Uh, this bears actually kind of an interesting resemblance to a berthier, uh, which has the same sort of structure, the box in front to house the clip, and then a trigger assembly in the back. Now, the action itself, first off, it's not so much that this was really sticky as there is no spring in it. So we have this bar that comes back, which holds the spring, and this sits inside the stock. And then the bolt travels, uh, let's see. Then the bolt travels from here back down into the receiver like that. In fact, we can see it. It's all the way back right now. And I can pull it forward. Now something jams it here. I don't know what that is. Oh, other than the fact that it's coming out the top of the action. It's being pushed up by the follower. So it gets to right here, and then it, it jams. And I don't know what's holding it. Oh, 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 maybe I do. Please stand by. Hey, I figured it out. You guys are getting this, like, live real time. So what was going on was the follower, which is just a spring-loaded, not quite straight, uh, arm was pushing up on the bolt and kind of jamming it in its guide rods, guide rails. So what's interesting here, doo -doo 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 -doo, let's, there we go. There are rails for the bolt, but they only start right back here. And we have this spring-loaded follower that's pushing up all the time. So if I just push the bolt forward on its handle, the follower pushes up and the bolt tries to climb up out of the ejection port. So what you have to do is hold the bolt down, and then it'll go into its rails, and then we push the back of the bolt up, and then it can go forward. So now it's fully in battery. Um, this does allow us to see that the locking surface is actually this, the exposed edge of the receiver itself. That's what's being pushed up. And then back here, there are a pair of swinging links. This is awesome. Awesome. I just figured out what those pins are. Now, let's see, let's open this all the way up. That's not all the way up. There we go. Okay. Now, with the bolt all the way open, we can see a couple of interesting features back here. There are, there, there's a pin here, and a second pin on this side, and then the bolt itself, I can kind of push it out of battery. You can see that the bolt is connected to these two arms, which run between the bolt itself right here. Get a pointer. So you've got the bolt itself right here, and then you've got the two arms down in there, and then you've got the actual operating rod at the side. And there are pins that connect the bolt via these two arms, that arm and that arm, back to these pins. What those do is actually, they work just like a 1911 pistol. Let me see if I can get this back into battery again. There we go. All right, now, watching it right there, you can see that when the bolt hits the very front of travel, so it's just about to stop, so it's just about to stop right up here, when that hits the front of travel, the operating rod continues to move, and because it's connected by these two fixed pivoting arms, those arms force the back of the bolt up, right there. So this locks into battery kind of the same way the 1911 does. Very interesting that, uh, well, I guess not, shouldn't be surprising, that Ed Browning was taking advantage of some of the ideas that his half-brother John Moses had come up with. So that is shades of the 1911 pistol right there. And I think
think that's about it. Now, the rest of the gun, there isn't a whole lot more that we can see that is uh, new here. But you can see the, the machine work on this is really quite crude in the areas where it's underneath everything. This was just a prototype shop model, basically. Um, get something that, that uses the right, um, this was just a shop model, really. Get something that works um, using the, the proper mechanism. So the gas piston is up here. It's interesting, there's no way to actually remove this gas piston without taking the front sight off the barrel, because otherwise none of this stuff can slide off the end of the barrel. But we have this housing here, which covers the piston. This holds the front handguard in place, and then this cap threads down onto our gas port right there. Well, thank you guys for staying through to the very, very end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. We got to see some really cool extra stuff uh, here at the end because I didn't figure it out until after I was done with the main filming. So, thanks for watching. Tune back in to our follow-up video on the next step of uh, this rifle design, which would be the Williams version of the Winchester G30.